All mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to thee. Holy Father, keep them in thy name which thou hast given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in thy name which thou hast given me. I have guarded them, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not pray that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is the truth. As thou didst send me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be consecrated in the truth. I do not pray for these only, but also for those who are to, to believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. followers of Christ might be one that the world might come to believe. Thomas Campbell, who planted the seeds that uh, became the uh, disciple denomination, while he was still a Presbyterian, gave uh, voice to his concern for unity and the concern for unity that our church has when he said, the church upon, of Jesus Christ upon earth is essentially, intentionally, and constitutionally one. Now, I wonder if you heard the certainty in that statement. He did not say the church of Jesus Christ should be one. He did not say the church of Jesus Christ one day will be one. He said, the church of Jesus Christ is one. Which is to say that whether or not the church knows it, whether or not the church acts like it, whether or not the church likes it, the church is one. Sometimes it doesn't look like it, but the church, he said, is one. And our denomination came into being as a, a movement that was intended to give support to the uh, quest for Christian unity. Our early founders gave voice to that uh, uh, theme when they coined the phrase, unity 
is our polar star. Have you ever heard that phrase? It's one of those phrases that, uh, that defined who disciples were when they began. Unity is our polar star. But across the uh, years, disciples have come to realize that it is not quite as simple as just saying that unity is our polar star. As one of our more modern leaders, more recent leaders uh, put it, Kenneth Teagarden, who was general minister and president, once said, it is one thing to have the ideal of Christian unity and another thing to, having a, to have a commitment to making unity a real thing. And all we have to do to recognize the truth of his statement is to remember that this movement for unity of which we are a part through the years has suffered at least two and by some accounts three uh, painful divisions itself. All of which is to say that uh, re realizing the prayer that Jesus prayed in his dying hours is not an easy thing. It requires a good deal of intentional hard work and there are all sorts of obstacles that have to be overcome if the unity for which Jesus prayed is uh, to become a reality. One of those uh, obstacles is the uh, mistaken idea that unity always means unanimity. Or to put it in different words, um, some people have the idea that in order for there to be unity, uh, every church has to worship in exactly the same way. Every church has to state its belief in exactly the same way. Every church has to behave in exactly the uh, same way. If unity is to come, they say, we all have to look and behave and worship in exactly the same way. And that's been um, an error that was made by people, well-intentioned people, who uh, got together and tried to put together a plan in which the church, every congregation of the church would look the same, its worship would be the same, the language it used would be the same, the way it was organized would be the same. But when you think about human nature, you know that's not likely to work. It's just not likely to work if we say unity means that we all, there has to be unanimity and we all have to look exactly the same. I'm thinking about an experience that I had back in uh, Nebraska in the little church that I served as the first church I had out of seminary. It was in a little town of 1,300 people and there were six churches um, within the city limits of that, uh, of that town. There was a disciple congregation. There was a Methodist. There was a Presbyterian. Uh, just outside of town, there was the United Church of Christ. There was a Missouri Synod Lutheran Church. And there was a church that referred to itself as the uh, Berean Fundamentalist Church. And uh, along about Thanksgiving one year, the people in the town, the town leaders, decided that it would be a good thing if the churches could get together and have a union service on Thanksgiving morning. So they made the mistake of turning that over to the Ministerial Association. And uh, the Ministerial Association cons consisted of the six of us who were ministers of those uh, uh, congregations. And uh, uh, we did what good Christians everywhere do. We talked it to death. And uh, then we did what good Americans everywhere do. We took a vote. And. Uh, when we took the vote, the result of the vote was four to two in favor of having a union service. When the uh, vote was taken, 
two of the ministers announced to the rest of the group that they and their congregation would not be participating in the um, Union Thanksgiving service that obviously was going to take place. We asked them why and got two different answers. One of them said, my denomination will not allow me to participate in a public worship service with uh, people of another denomination. I can come to the ministerial association meetings, but I cannot participate in a worship service where prayers are offered by those who are of a different denomination from mine. The problem, it seems, was that the wording of the prayers might not be up to the standard of, uh, of his denomination. And so he said he and his church would not be participating. The other minister said to us, uh, I'm not going to participate and my congregation isn't going to participate. And as a matter of fact, I'm no longer going to be attending the meetings of this ministerial association because, uh, he said, I don't think the rest of you take the scriptures seriously enough. And as a matter of fact, I'm not at all sure that any of you are really Christians. 1,300 people six churches and only four of us could gather together on Thanksgiving morning and lift our pray prayers of praise and thanksgiving to God. Now I might have been terribly critical of those ministers in their congregations, probably was at the time. It would have been an easy thing to be critical of them if it weren't for the fact that I have to acknowledge that uh, more than once the uh, movement of which I am a part has fallen into the grave error of saying only those who do things exactly the way we do them are really Christians. You see the unity on which our forefather, in which our forefathers and mothers believed uh, was predicated on the fact, on the belief, that all a person had to do in order to know what the church ought to be like was to open up to the book of Acts and read the book of Acts and anybody with uh, good sense and, and eyes to read uh, would, they said, be able to see there in the book of Acts the way in which the church was to be organized, the way in which the church was to worship, what the church was to believe, and the language in which the church was to express its belief. All you had to do, they said, was to read the book of Acts, and if you read the book of Acts, everybody do things exactly the way we in the Christian church do them. Except we came to understand it wasn't true. We now, across the years, have come to the place where we understand that anybody who opens up the Bible and looks at a passage of Scripture, reads it through the lens of their own experiences, through the lens of all the experiences that they've had in their life. And if that is true, that means that uh, almost any two people who uh, read a particular passage of Scripture are likely to interpret it differently. Doesn't mean one of them is right and one of them is wrong, but their experiences help them to see something different in the passage from what we see. We've also, across the years, come to understand that in the New Testament there is uh, more than one way in which various congregations were organized. More than one way in which various congregations expressed their belief in Jesus Christ. Take, for example, 
Take, for example, the way in which the scriptures speak about the Lord's Supper. Take, for example, those passages in the Gospels that uh, talk to us about the way in which the Lord's Supper came to be initiated through Jesus' observance of the Last uh, Supper with his disciples. If you are inclined to read, read the Gospel of Mark, you will find there in the Gospel of Mark a very simple, brief, and straightforward description of what happened at the Last Supper. Just a very few sentences, nothing fancy, just very brief and simple. If you find yourself drawn to the Gospel of Matthew and read what Matthew has to say about it, you'll discover that by the time Matthew was written, the church that Matthew knew was uh, celebrating the Lord's Supper in a little more formal way than the church that Mark knew in his Gospel. If you are drawn to the Gospel of Luke, as I always am, um, you may be surprised to you know that the church that Luke knew took the cup first and then the bread and then a second cup. Completely different from the way in which Mark, from the church that Mark and Matthew knew. If you are drawn to reading the Gospel of Mark, you will discover that the church that Mark knew, or that John knew, was in the habit of a foot washing ceremony before they observed the Lord's Supper. Now the question is, is one of those more Christian than the other? Or is it possible, is it possible that uh, well-minded, well faithful Christians can celebrate the Lord's Supper in more than one way? Or is there only one Christian way that it must be celebrated? Well, I think, however, that the real obstacle that has to be overcome in the, the search for Christian unity is that uh, most of us have a very difficult time thinking that it makes any difference, that the search for Christian unity makes any difference to the world in which we live, makes any difference in the way life unfolds for us. Or to put it more bluntly, most of us have a great deal of trouble coming up with an answer to the question, why should I care? Why should I care about this business of Christian unity? So I wonder if you'd put up with it for just a moment this morning, if I gave you just one reason why you and I ought to care about Christian unity. Anybody who is paying attention to the world in which we live, knows that it is a severely divided world. Those divisions have brought us to the point where we live in constant fear and hatred. And that fear and hatred is in grave danger of destroying not only the country in which we live, but destroying the whole world in which we live. But what if, what if Christians could learn to live in a way that takes seriously the things that are important to us without demeaning the things that are important to somebody else? What if we Christians could learn to live in, a, in the world and model for the world a way of life that would bring healing to the world's divisions. Oh, I remember when I was uh, growing up, in all my growing up years, it always seemed that 
No matter what town we lived in or what neighborhood we lived in, <clears throat> either down the street from us or across the street from us or perhaps next door to us would live a Roman Catholic family. And I would wager that many of you have had this experience as well. Uh, we knew the names of those people who lived across the street or down the street or next door to us. We knew that they were Roman Catholics and they knew our names and they knew we were Protestants. And when Sunday morning rolled around, our family would go off to our um, Protestant uh, church that claimed to have a corner on the, the Church of the New Testament. It was a non-liturgical church with a very simple uh, form of worship. It was completely devoid of any tradition except for the tradition of observing every week the Lord's Supper. And in the church I went to when I was a kid, um, the minister had no part in the Lord's Supper. It was the realm of the elders. The elders and the deacons uh, claimed the table as their own and the minister claimed the pulpit as his own and it was a him in those days. Uh, claimed a, the pulpit as his own and never the twain shall meet. Uh, but here's the thing. Every Sunday morning when we went off to our Protestant church that claimed to have a corner on the New Testament, our neighbors who were Roman Catholic went off to their church that claimed to have uh, a corner on being the true church. Their worship was different from ours, much more uh, complicated than ours. Theirs was a tradition full of, rich with, uh, uh, with tradition, not like ours that didn't have any tradition at all. Their services were much more complicated than ours. But every Sunday, every Sunday, like us, they observed the Lord's Supper. In their church, the minister, the priest, uh, was central in the observance of the Lord's Supper. And the lady didn't have much to do with it all except to receive the supper. But you know what? Every time they observed the Lord's <coughs> Supper, they did exactly the same thing that we in our church where the minister didn't have anything to do with it and where there wasn't much tradition associated with it. They did the same thing as we did. Whenever they took the supper, they looked to Jesus as the pattern for their life and the source of their salvation. And when church was over at our little Protestant church and church was over at their Roman Catholic church, they would go home and we would go home and we would look at each other across the street again. Not with open hostility, but with a question in our mind as to whether either one of us was really, truly Christian. The question was always there. Are those people across there? And it was there in their minds too. Are those people across the street really Christian? And meanwhile, the world was being torn apart by the Korean War and then by the Vietnam War, and now by the war with ISIS. And Jesus is left in the garden, weeping, because his prayer has not yet been realized. Will you pray with me? Gracious God is the bread which we break at the table was scattered over the mountains and then brought together and became one. So let your church be brought together from the ends of the earth into your eternal realm 
For yours is the glory and the power through Jesus Christ forever and ever. Amen.